Well, if you do have a Bible with you, uh, perhaps you can open it in the passage that we read just a few moments ago in the service from uh, Luke, uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 14. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's great to be here this morning. And it's great to see so many visitors amongst us. And uh, <coughs> we'd like to thank you all for coming. Um, it's a joyous occasion uh, for us, isn't it? To gather to celebrate the engagement of Dan and, uh, and Beth. Ever since uh, Daniel uh, proposed, uh, I think back in February, um, of course, both of them have been busy making plans because there's so much to arrange, isn't there? There's so many different things to sort out and uh, plans to make. Um, the lots to think about, everything from venues to menus and everything in between. And of course, they've already started uh, thinking about uh, many of those, uh, those things. Um, but some people these days, they find that uh, because there's so much to arrange and so many things to think about, um, they go online and they look up what they call professional wedding planners. You can get them now. I didn't even know they existed um, until a short while ago. But you can go online and you can get these professional wedding planners and they'll take the brunt of the work for you. They'll, I don't know, do all the arrangements and then all you have to do is sort of come along yeah. and agree and sort of tick the boxes and, and away you go. It must be, uh, must be great to be, able to, do, to be able to do that. I'm sure they're very expensive. Um, but they take the brunt of the work, don't they? And then all, all you have to do is sit back and relax and enjoy, uh, enjoy yourself. Well, the passage that we've read this morning from Luke's Gospel, um, chapter 14, Jesus speaks in this passage to us of the divine wedding planner. The divine wedding planner. He tells us in verse 16, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. He uh, tells this parable uh, in response to a man who spoke to him at a dinner party. He's there in verse 15. He says, when one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things, he said to him, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Now, I don't know about you, but I've met that man many times myself. Um, he's the kind of man who, whenever they meet a vicar, let's say, and I'm not a vicar, but when they meet somebody like me, perhaps, uh, they always have to say something. They've always got something up their sleeve, some comments that they have to bring. But this man, he, he does that as they're reclining at, the, at dinner, there in this, the home of this ruler of the Pharisees, but it's a, it's a throwaway statement, isn't it? It's a pious platitude, really. Uh, and you almost expect the Lord Jesus to reply with a, to reply with a, amen, brother. You almost expect him to say something like that because, well, it's true, isn't it? Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Amen, brother. You expect him to sort of agree and to have a big smile on his face and oh, a wonderful statement you've made or, or something like that. But instead, the Lord Jesus Christ tells this man a parable, uh, the parable that we have in these verses, a parable about the divine wedding planner. Now, a parable, a parable is not just, you know, a nice story for the children. That's how very often they've been portrayed in the history of the church, sadly. You know, a, an earthly story with a heavenly kingdom. It's all very nice, uh, with a heavenly meaning. Uh, it's all very nice and it sounds very good, but you know, the parables are much more than that. The parables, if we, if we understand them right, are really like ticking time bombs. I don't know if you like spicy food. Um, I'm not too keen myself and uh, I have to be careful because I'm not I'm just not used to it but sometimes if you eat something spicy you know what it's like there's a bit of a delay isn't there there's a bit of you put it in your mouth and you start and you think oh it's not bad I, you know 
kind of start to enjoy that. And then all of a sudden, boom, there's kind of almost an explosion in your mouth and you think, what am I going to do? And you've got to get some drink down you or something. You, you try and combat the, the explosion in some sort of way. Well, if I can say it like this, that's, the, that's what these, these parables are like of the Lord Jesus. What he, he tells us these stories, he tells us these parables in order to convey a message, but it's a very important one. And it's almost as though Jesus is saying with these parables, if you're prepared to linger on what I'm telling you now, if you're prepared to just think deeply about these messages, about these, these parables, it's going to blow your mind. If you really understand what I'm saying to you here, it's very, very important. And every single one of us needs to understand. Now in this parable, Basically, if I can put it in just a few words, the time bomb, the message is this. God is planning a great party, but no one wants to come. That's the tragedy of the human heart. That's the position that every single human being in our sinful, sinful hearts, that's the response that we give to, to God. He's planning a great party, but no one wants to come. I wonder if you've ever thought of God in, like, in that way. Most people don't, do they? Most people, if they think of God at all, they think that he's some kind of cosmic killjoy. They think that he's almost like a, you know, a, a heavenly policeman just waiting to catch you out. Or a judge just sitting there waiting and relishing the opportunity to condemn you. That's what people think about God, isn't it, very often? Most people will think that the devil, well, he's the one that likes fun, enjoyment. And God, well, he'd rather we just all sort of sit down and live in misery. That's what most people think about God, and that's why they don't want to have anything to do with him. But I want to say to you, as clearly as I possibly can from God's word this morning, Nothing could be further from the truth. God himself, Jesus is telling us, is the great wedding planner. He is the one that wants joy for you and me. He is the one that wants to bless and to bring us in. He is the one that wants to gather the people to himself so that they can enjoy him and enjoy this wonderful banquet that he is preparing. He wants you to come. But the fact of the matter is that nobody wants to come. So let's look at this parable for a few moments this morning, shall we, as we, uh, as we celebrate the engagement of Dan at Beth. Let's see what Jesus has to say about this great banquet that God is preparing. And there's just two things that I want to say to you this morning. I want to draw your attention first of all to the guest list. The guest list. And then secondly, I want to draw your attention to the late cancellations that Jesus speaks of here in this passage. Let's think about the guest list. Uh, first of all, that's always that's always the most difficult part, isn't it, about planning a wedding? Um, who to include? Who have you got to leave out? And of course, no wedding planner wants to uh, offend anybody, of course. And everybody would love to be able to say, well, everybody can come. But of course, normally there's limited places. And so you have to think about invitations and so on and who you have to leave out well look at the the guest list here in this passage look who is invited at first sight it seems as though the guest list is very limited look at verse 12 he says he said also to the man who had invited him when you give a dinner or a banquet do not invite your friends or your or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors lest they also invite you in return and you'll be repaid. 
But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the, line, the lame, and the blind. Now, it almost seems at first sight as though Jesus is saying, well, that the guest list is very limited and you're not to invite friends and, and family and so on. And he says, um, you wouldn't want that now, would you? I mean, that comes as a bit of a shock, doesn't it, to us? I mean, of course, you know, we, they, they're going to invite their friends and the family and, and relatives. Of course, of course you do. Jesus is saying something very special here, isn't it? He wants to shock us. He wants us to think very deeply about what he's saying. Uh, but it comes as a surprise to us. It's almost as though he's saying, you know, don't invite your family and friends, you know, be careful now. You wouldn't, want them, you wouldn't want them to invite you back, would you? Now, the interesting thing about what Jesus is saying here is that the list is repeated again in verse 21. You look at verse 21, it says this, Go out quickly to the streets and the lanes and the city and bring in the poor and the crippled, the blind and the lame. It's exactly the same list as he's mentioned before in verse 13, uh, or verse 12 rather. Um, it's exactly the same list. And so we're forced to ask the question, why, why does uh, Jesus do this? Why is the list repeated? Well, if you look closely at the passage, you'll realize that it's because God has invited his friends and his family. He's referring to the Jewish nation there, but they didn't want to come. That's the point, isn't it? And so what does God do? He opens the doors to everyone, and that's referring to the Gentiles. That's us, most of us. Now, this is why what Jesus is, is doing here, really, that's why he was always at dinner, you know. It's, it's quite surprising, but you look at Luke's Gospel, you read through Luke's Gospel sometime, and you'll find that 16 on 16 different occasions, Jesus is found eating and drinking. No wonder they called him a glutton and a, and a drunkard, because he was always eating and drinking. It was a great criticism. They hated him for it. They criticized him for it. But you see, Jesus was very deliberate in what he did. He did it on purpose. He was telling us something. He was giving us a message. He was always going to dinner parties. 16 times in, in Luke's gospel. That's a lot, isn't it? That's a lot. And what is he telling us? He's telling us something very important about God himself, isn't he? He's doing this deliberately because he wants us to know that this is what God is like. God isn't the killjoy in the sky, as it were. He is the one who is planning this great party, this great wedding. And, it's, uh, and he wants everyone to know that they're all welcome. The whole world is invited. That's the point, isn't it? You know, the Bible really tells us that before the world began, God was already making plans. There are verses in the Old Testament, in Isaiah 25, for example. He speaks to us of this great wedding party, of this great banquet. Let me just read a few verses. Um, in Isaiah 25. You don't need to turn there. But he says this, On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, a rich food full of marrow, of aged wine, well-refined. And he will swallow upon this mountain the covering that is cast over all the people, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people will be will, he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. What's Isaiah doing there? Well, 700 years before Christ came, he's telling us that God is making plans. There's his great wedding banquet. It's the, the wedding banquet of his own son. And it's a picture for us of heaven there in Isaiah 25. And he tells us it's going to be the best food and the best wine. And everyone is invited. And it's going to last forever. Why? Because he's going to swallow death up. And death is going to be destroyed. This party is going to go on forever, in other words. That's why Jesus came eating and drinking. Because he wants us to know this is our God. This is what he wants. God would fill you with joy 
if you would only, only take it. Every one of us is invited to this wedding banquet. So I can confidently say this morning from God's word, he wants you to come as well. Did you know that? God wants you in the wedding of his son. That's why the Bible starts and ends with a wedding. In Genesis chapter 2, we have the coming together of Adam and Eve. Flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. There's, the, there's this united, there's this wedding. And then right at the end in Revelation chapter uh, chapter 19, it speaks of the wedding of the, the, the banquet of the, of, of the Lamb. And then, incredibly, almost the very last verse of the Bible. Listen to what he says. Revelation chapter 22, verse, seven, verse uh, 17. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who, who desires take the water of life without price. You see what he's doing there? It's begun right back in Genesis. And it goes on all the way through the Bible. There's these invitations going out. Come. Come to the wedding feast. Come to my son. Come to this joyous, joyous banquet. Come to heaven. Come to glory. Come with me. And he goes on and on and on all the way through the scripture until we, we arrive right at the end, the last chapter, and almost the very last verse. And I don't know about you, but I like to use my, my imagination a little bit in a verse like this. And I can almost see John, who's writing the book of Revelation. And it's almost as though he, as he's walking off into the distance, He's going off into glory himself. He's walking away now. He's leaving us. He's penning the very last words, as it were. And it's almost as though he looks over the shoulder, his shoulder and says, Oh, but don't forget to come. I'm going now, but don't forget to come. It's his last word, as it were. He wants you to come to him. That you might experience joy. Joy like you've never known before. Even to the very last moment in the Bible, he's inviting us and he repeats the word come three times in that verse because he wants us to make no mistake about it. And the spirit and the bride, that's the church, say come. And so here this morning we say come. Come. So let me ask you, will you? Will you? I'm not uh, announcing uh, anything right now uh, at this point. Uh, so I'm going to say if you receive uh, an invitation from Dan Beth to their wedding, if you do, well, <clears throat> I'm, I'm pretty sure you'll probably do everything you possibly can to get there, won't you? You would want, want to have a very good excuse, wouldn't you? A very good reason um, to say no. Well, I want to ask you right now, what are you going to do with the invitation that God has given to you even today? Will you respond? Will you come? Well, that brings me to the second point, and that is the late cancellations that Jesus speaks of in this passage in verses 18 to 20, he said, <clears throat> But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please excuse me. And another said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to examine them. Please excuse me. And another said, Well, I've married a wife and therefore I can't come. Well, you only have to read those verses to know that how flimsy those <coughs> excuses really are. They're pathetic, aren't they? They really are pathetic. They're insulting to the master of the house, to the one who's planning the wedding. Um, you know, in those days, there were no such things as fridges. And so if you were planning a large party for many people, of course, you had to have an idea as to how many people were coming. So what they would do, of course, is they would send out a, a pre-invitation. Um, you know, uh, just to see how many is going to come. I asked uh, Beth yesterday, you know, after the, the venue and so on, the dates uh, decided, well, 
what's next in the in the planning? And immediately she said, well, uh, the uh, reserve the day uh, notices. So there's going to be a sort of a pre-invitation, if you like, to make sure you reserve the day. Well, it was similar in biblical times. They would send out a, an initial invitation and in order to gather an, an understanding, to gain an understanding of how many people were going to respond. And that was very important because if you were planning for thousands of people and then only 50 turned up, well, you've got a lot of wasted food, haven't you? Or the opposite way around, of course, that would be a, a tragedy. It was very important for them to know how many people were coming. And, uh, and that's what's uh, going on here, of course, in this, in, in this wedding, this banquet. <clears throat> Everybody was saying to this initial invitation, oh, yes, yes, we'll, we'll be there. You know, of course, he's referring in, historically in this passage to the Jews. And, and, and they're all saying, yeah, yeah, of course, we'll, we'll, you, know, don't, you can count on us. We'll be there. And then the moment really arrives and they all start saying, oh, sorry, uh, I've bought a field. I haven't looked at it yet, um, but I'm gonna, I bought it. And I'm, I'm going to, who buys a field without even looking at it? Oh, I bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to go and have a look. I'm going to examine them. Really? Would you fork out so much in order for five to get five yoke of oxen? That's a massive expense. And you haven't even seen them. I mean, it's ridiculous, isn't it? It's, it's insulting. And who in those days would have dared to say, you know, in front of their friends, oh, I got married, so she won't let me. Uh, <laughs> it's not going to happen. I mean, the whole thing is pathetic, isn't it? They're just insults. They're excuses. <clears throat> Someone has said that a, an excuse is nothing more than a skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. And that's what these are. I've got something better to do. I know you've invited me to the party. I know you've gone to great expense. And I know I've said yes in the past, but I've got something better to do. So I'm not coming. That's what Jesus is talking about. That's what Jesus is, is saying. People do with God and the gospel. They're like the man in verse 15 at the beginning of the passage when he says, Oh, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. They're just words. Jesus knows it. It's just empty words, a pious platitude. <clears throat> he says, oh, won't it be wonderful? Won't it be wonderful to go to heaven? What a, what a nice thought. How many people at funerals say things like that? So often. Oh, he's in a better place now. Oh, you know, it's wonderful. Wonderful. You know, oh, he's in a better place now. And, and so on. They think... Uh, you know, think of heaven in that kind of way. Jesus, do you see what Jesus is saying to this man? Will you come in? Blessed is everyone who eats bread in the kingdom of heaven. Oh, really? Are you coming? I didn't know. Are you really coming to the feast? Have you sent your RSVP? You see the point? Everybody's invited. But no one wants to come. Many people won't come. They will make excuse after excuse. And the question is, is that you? What if I were to say to you, it's, I know some of you live in a distance, so, you know, it's limited what I can say now, but if I, what if I was to say to you, look, it's wonderful to see you here today. It really is. How about you come next week? Or if you can't come here, go to a church in your area that preaches the gospel and really start to seek the Lord. How about getting your Bible out and reading it at home? How about asking the Lord in prayer, Lord, help me to understand this because I don't. I, I, I don't get it. How about you go to the Lord and you say, Lord, Lord, this is so important and I want to know Please tell me, please explain, please help me to understand and help me to find a church that I can go to where I'm going to get challenged perhaps in the word of God and the word is going to be explained to me. 
How, how about how, how about doing that next week? What do you think? How many of you would perhaps say, well, you know, <clears throat> uh, I, I wash the car Sunday mornings. And I work so hard during the week. And you know that Sunday is my only day off. And really, you know, it's, it's my only chance of a lie-in. How many, how many would just sort of start making excuses? Don't you see yourself in it? Don't you see yourself in the passage? Oh, wouldn't it be wonderful to go to heaven? Yes, it would. Well, what are you going to do about it then? That's the point, isn't it? What about RSVP? What about seeking God? What about closing in on Christ? What about coming to the Lord and saying, Lord, have mercy upon me. Lord, change me. Lord, speak to me. You see what Jesus is saying here? We make excuses. So many people do. And you see what Jesus says about that? Verse 21, he says, So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled, the blind and the lame. Jesus is talking about his father and he says he became angry. Angry at these excuses. Angry at the hardness of people's hearts. Angry at the rejection of the gospel invitation. He became angry. Now, when I become angry, I've got to tell you, it brings out the worst in me. And I'm sure it's the same with you. But what happens when God got angry here? Does he lash out? No, he reaches out, doesn't he? It's almost as though it brings the best out of him. He sends an invite to everyone else. And he tells them to go to everyone that was excluded from the Old Testament. These people that are mentioned there in verse 21, the, the, blind, the poor and the blind and so on, they would have been totally excluded in the Old Testament. They wouldn't have would been able to come near the temple. They weren't welcome. And God says, you can come. Everyone, come now, you see. And then he sends him out to get some more in. He says, go into the highways. and Go into the hedges. What's he saying? He's talking about homeless people, isn't he? He's talking about people who are absolutely destitute. Go anywhere you can. Go and get people in. Get people in. Because he wants everyone to enjoy the benefit, the blessing of this wonderful banquet. So you see the point? If you won't come, then someone else will take your place. That's, that's what we call sovereign grace. I love what Spurgeon said once in prayer. He said, uh, oh Lord, save all the elect and then elect some more. Lord, bring them in. Bring them in. That man in verse 15, he's got to be one of the saddest characters in the Bible, isn't he? Don't you think? There he is. He's simply assuming that all is well. He's in the home of a, a, very, a, a very important man, a, a ruler of the Pharisees. And there he is, and he's lying next to Jesus, and, and they're eating together. And what a wonderful opportunity he gets. And then he sort of comes out with this wonderful statement, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom, in the kingdom of, of, of God. He's probably, well, he's, he's not probably, he's, he's a Jew, of course. He's a very religious man. He's looking forward to heaven, isn't he? Blessed is everyone. And he's just assuming, of course, that he's going to be there. And Jesus tells him in this parable, look, unless you make a response, unless you respond, you're not coming. You won't be there. And I wonder maybe whether some of you are doing the same. Some of you, perhaps, were brought up in a Christian home. You got used to going to church when you were children, maybe twice a week. You were taught the Bible. 
Maybe you're familiar with the Bible. Maybe you're familiar with its teachings. And perhaps you even, you know, agree with it to a point. You haven't rebelled against it. You haven't rejected it. You, uh, you agree, really, with, uh, with most of what I've been saying, perhaps, this morning. But you've never really closed in on Christ yourself. That's tragic. So what are you to do? Well, look at verse 17. At the end of verse 17, he says, Come, for everything is now ready. That's a very important statement, you know. It's very specific. In terms of this wedding banquet that God is planning, and preparing, he says to each one of us now here this morning, come, because everything is now ready. What does he mean? Well, you remember what Jesus said on the cross? His last words, almost. It is finished. That's not a cry of despair. He doesn't say... I am finished. I'm done. I can't take any more. No. He says, it is finished. He's referring to the work that he has been doing. His death on the cross was an accomplishment. It wasn't a tragedy. He was doing something. He was giving himself as the sacrifice for sin. So that... For us now, all we have to do is what? Come. Because it's done. Because everything's ready. There's nothing left to do. Do you understand that? This is the wonder of the gospel, you know. For all of us, we're all of us sinners and incapable of making our, presenting ourselves before God. But God comes to us this morning and says, look, it's, I've done it. It's done. And all you've got to do is come. Come to me. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Come and cast yourself upon him. Come in faith and in repentance. Come believing that what he has done is everything that's needed. Come. Can I urge you to do that this morning? If you've never done that before, then do it now. Before it's too late. And when you get the invitation from Dan and Beth, remember the wedding of the Lamb. And if you haven't responded by then, it tells you an awful lot about yourself, doesn't it? Respond now. Why would you wait? Everything is ready. Christ has done it all. There's nothing to add. You don't have to earn your way into heaven. It's done. He's done it. And we rejoice in that glorious hope of eternal life. What a prospect. If you're a believer here this morning, what a prospect, don't you think? We've been invited to the wedding of the Lamb. We're going to eat the finest of food and the age of wine, he says. And it's going to go on forever. It's a wonderful, wonderful wedding. I'm looking forward to next year. Um, I should not get an invite. Uh, <laughs> but oh, what a day that will be when we stand before the Lord and he says, Come, you are blessed by my Father. Let's pray.